So I, I found something fascinating this week, and this is kind of a uh, off the topic. It's not on the topic that I'm going to be preaching on, but I want to share this with you because it's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, we're all aware it's 2020, right? Yep. You're, you, you're starting to write the checks and put the dates right. Uh, so we're all aware it's 2020. Well, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 20, verse 20. That's a fascinating thing that's, uh, that I'm going to show you if you haven't been aware of this. Acts chapter 20, verse 20. Paul was traveling on his way to Jerusalem, and he was coming by Ephesus. He didn't actually stop in Ephesus, but he went by the church, and he invited the elders of the church to come and meet him at a place called Miletus. And uh, he met with the, the leaders of the church in Ephesus. And he was sharing with them some encouragement, some of the things that he had done and was doing. And here he says in, in verse 20, as he's going, he says, How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house. This year, as we're going to focus this beginning series on evangelism, on going to our neighbors door to door, Acts 20, verse 20 Paul talks about going door to door. I just thought that fascinating. I want to share it with you. So if you want a memory verse for 2020, it's Acts 2020. It's about us going out and uh, sharing the gospel in public with our neighbors as we go about what we're doing. So bear that in mind. And I know that the, the, the verse and chapter breakdown in the Bible are not inspired by the Holy Spirit. They came afterwards, but God uses that. And it's amazing how these numbers work together. So don't forget that. Now for the message. Did you, have you ever played word association? You know, when I give you a word and you start thinking of pictures of something else, um, you know, what, what comes to mind when I think, when I mention politician? <laughs> Different politicians, angry. What, what comes to mind if I think of a, a CrossFit fanatic, someone that's passionate about CrossFit? Now just, just, you don't have to blurt it out, but just think about what, what you think about. What do you think about if I mention the word millennial? M many of you are thinking. <laughs> Sorry, guys. But that's what I think of when, you, when someone mentions millennial, someone that's stuck to a screen. What comes to mind, though, when I say the word Christian? What comes to mind when you hear the word Christian? You know... That word is, has so many different associations with it. In our culture, in our broader culture, if you ask 10 people what they understand or think of when you say Christian, you'll probably get as many different answers. And if you ask someone, are you a Christian, you may get a variety of different answers from beginning of saying, yes, I, I, know, I know about Jesus. I'm not a Muslim, therefore I must be a Christian. Or well, I'm not this other religion, therefore I'm a Christian. I was born in America, therefore I must be a Christian. Well, someone else might say, no, I know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I have a personal relationship with him. I am a Christian. There's a vast difference between those two. So what it is to be a Christian, the name Christian can sometimes be misleading. When we go uh, on, on the streets and share the gospel, I know Bill and Julia and others are very familiar with this. If you ask people, are you a Christian? They'll say, yeah, yeah, of course. It's a way of saying, leave me alone. I'm okay. I don't want to enter into a deeper spiritual conversation. And so sometimes the word Christian can detract from the true meaning of what we want to convey by the, by the term Christian. You know, the, the, the followers of Jesus at the beginning uh, of the early church didn't call themselves Christians. They called themselves disciples of Jesus or followers of the way. But they used the word disciple way more than they used Christian. In fact, in the Bible, we see the word Christian three times. Only three times. We see the word disciple 281 times. 
And the word Christian in the Bible was actually a derogatory term. It was one that was put on them as kind of a slander. And the early church, as we read in Acts 11, 26, in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Note, it's the disciples that were called Christians. They were known as disciples first and foremost. So a disciple is a far more accurate understanding of what it is to be a Christian. And I'm not saying we need to change our language, but we need to understand what it is to be a disciple, to be a follower of Jesus. And I think that gives us a clear understanding of who we are and what we're called to be as Christians. In fact, when we look at the word disciple, and we're going to unpack it a little bit today, when we look at the word disciple, we may come to understand that people who say they are Christians are actually not disciples of Jesus Christ, followers of Jesus. So turn to me today. Our passage is going to be in Matthew chapter 4. And Matthew chapter 4, we're just looking at verse 18 to 22. And it's a, it's a well-known text. It's familiar, but it's fascinating as Jesus calls his first disciples. So starting at verse 18, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Again, this is a, a well-known passage. It's not something that you're unfamiliar with. You've, you've heard this before. You've read it probably many times. But it seems a little confusing in, in, if you read it in our culture, in our context. When you read this, it almost sounds unreal. Jesus walks up to this group of fishermen, and uh, he just says, follow me. Doesn't say anything else. He just walks up to this group of fishermen, and immediately they drop everything and follow him. It's almost as if he performed a miracle or some kind of mind trick that imagine it's like a sales technique. Imagine if you could have that sales technique, buy this product, and they just buy the product. Jesus walks up to them and says, follow me, and immediately they follow him. No question, no debate, no, where are you taking me? They just follow him. Have you ever thought about that? It's amazing, but if we understand what actually was taking place in the first century, their culture of who Jesus was and their understanding of who he was, it makes a whole lot of sense. You see, just looking back in the, in the culture a little bit, in the, in the Hebrew culture, Boys, all boys at the age of five went to school. They went to kind of, a, it was called a Torah school, really, to learn the Old Testament. But at the age of five, they would begin learning and memorizing what we call the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They would be studying these books of the Bible. That's the school that every Hebrew boy went to. And then around about the age 10, if you were an exceptional student and you were good, you were allowed to continue on to the rest of the Torah, the rest of the Old Testament as we know it today. The other guys that kind of got, they got cut. They didn't make the grade. They weren't exceptional students. They were told, okay, you can go back. You can go back to your father's workshop to the trade that your, uh, your parents have, to the workplaces. You can go back to being a fisherman. You can go back to being a carpenter. You can go back because you didn't make the grade. You weren't an exceptional student. And then around about the age of 17, these exceptional students, these upper grade students, then had to make a decision. Do I want to follow a rabbi and become like a rabbi, or do I want to then go back into a workplace and a trade? But by the age of 17, they had learned the Torah. They were exceptionally versed in the Old Testament as we know it today. They knew it well. 
And so some of them would then go and they would become disciples of a rabbi. And how they would do that was they would go to the rabbi and they would sit at his feet. They would just walk up to him and sit at his feet. Now remember in this culture, in the, in the first century and way before that, in the Hebrew culture, to be a rabbi was the top Next to the king, you were a pretty important person. It was the goal that everybody wanted to be. In our culture, I don't know, we have so many different idols, but, you know, it's like being a world-famous golfer or NBA player. It was, it was the elite. It was the cream of the crop to be a rabbi. You were respected by everybody. So everybody wanted to be one of those if you were a young man in the Hebrew culture. So they would go and find a rabbi, that they liked and respected, that they wanted to learn from, and they would sit at his feet. And then he would begin to question them. He'd begin to ask them questions and, and begin to challenge them and see if they were sharp enough to be his, what they called, Talmud. And a Talmud was a young disciple, a follower. And if he questioned them and, and they had chosen him as the rabbi, if he said, okay, I'm willing to take you on as a Talmud, my young apprentice, in other words, I'll allow you to follow me. And then they began this process of becoming a disciple and being a disciple of a rabbi. And that process took years of following, going everywhere the rabbi went, being with the rabbi at all times, living with the rabbi, learning from them. In fact, one of the sayings was, do you have the dust of the rabbi, your rabbi, on you? You're walking so close with him that you actually have his dust on you. That's what it meant to be a Talmud. And these collection of Talmuds, these followers were Talmudim, is the plural of that. But a rabbi wouldn't just allow anybody to be his follower. A rabbi would be very selective in his Talmudim. Because he wasn't just looking for a student, he was looking for someone that would be like him to do what he did, to know what he did, to know God like he knows God, and to do the same things that he did. In other words, to be his representation. Is that making sense? So that's what it was in the ancient culture. So these fishermen, they looked to Jesus and they knew that he was a rabbi. Remember, from the age of 12, Jesus was teaching in the synagogue. They knew Jesus. He was a rock star rabbi in that time. He was well known. And when he came in and said, follow me, they dropped everything because the rabbi had called them. It was a reversal of the normal culture. And that's the first point. In this passage, there are five things that we can learn about this relationship and the first one is that Jesus doesn't choose the best, he chooses the willing. Jesus doesn't choose the best, he chooses the willing. Remember verse, verse 18, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Jesus, this new rabbi, he chooses Peter and Andrew, who are fishermen. And the fact that they are fishermen tells us a little bit about them. They didn't make the cut, right? They were told, okay, you're a, good, you're a good young student, but you're not good enough. Go back home. Go back to your father. Go back fishing. They didn't make the cut. They were kind of the, the B team, if you will. And Jesus walks up to them and says, I choose you to be my Talmudim. I choose you to be my followers. And Jesus, as I said, was a well-known fisherman. They knew, or well-known rabbi. They knew who he was. These, these young fishermen knew who Jesus was, and he calls them. Here's this up-and-coming rabbi, and, and in fact, remember what John the Baptist said about Jesus? He says, I'm not even worthy to tie his laces on his sandals. That's how great Jesus is. John the Baptist was the greatest, the greatest teacher at the time. Everybody, even Jesus, looked up to him and, and honored him. 
So naturally, when Jesus calls them, they jump at the opportunity. They don't debate. They don't ask him, well, where are you going to take us? They jumped at the opportunity because this rabbi had called them and chosen them. And we, get, we lose that in our culture. We lose that in, in our lack of understanding of the history. But when Jesus called them, it was like they hit the jackpot. They've suddenly gone from being a nobody to being somebody of enormous character and somebody that the people around would respect. So they jumped and said, yes, we'll follow you. But you know, when Jesus chooses his team, his disciples, he chooses what the world says is the B team. He chooses those that the world says, you're not good enough. And Jesus comes in and chooses them. He calls them. He chooses guys with not much potential, not much personal power, probably not very well versed in the Pentateuch, the, the, origin, the original pieces of the Torah. But he chooses them and he says, I want you to become like me. I want you to follow me, but I'm going to train you so that you can become like me. To know God the way he knows God, he knows God. To do things that Jesus did the way he did them. But Jesus doesn't choose the best, he chose the willing. John MacArthur says, God skipped all the wise of the day, the great scholars who were in Egypt, the great library was in Alexandria, the great philosophers were in Athens, the powerful were in Rome. He passed over Herodotus, the historian, and Socrates, the great thinker, and Julius Caesar, and he chose people that were so ordinary, it was comical. No rabbis, no teachers, no religious experts. Jesus chose the B team. And because the work that Jesus had for them required more than any human being could do in their own strength. Jesus chose the B team because nobody in the world could do what Jesus was calling them to do in their own strength. It was impossible. The problem is that people with a lot of talent, with a lot of natural giftings, those talents and giftings will get in the way of relying on the Holy Spirit, relying on the presence of God to do what only God can do. J.D. Greer says, Jesus taught that his power in the weakest vessel was infinitely greater than the greatest talent without him. His power in the weakest vessel is infinitely greater than the greatest talent without him. <clears throat> God wants to use you in your family, in your workplace, where you are today for his glory, not because of what you can do in your own strength, but because of what the Holy Spirit can do in and through you. That is what God can do and wants to do through you. And we often say this, God doesn't call the um, equipped, he equips the called. It makes sense. God equips those that he calls, not because of anything that we have in our own strength. Talking about John the Baptist, Jesus said that he was the greatest preacher who ever lived. Matthew eleven eleven, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there, was, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Let that sink in. The one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. Jesus said John the Baptist is the greatest who had ever lived up until that time. But the one who is least... You see, you and I live in the new covenant. We live in the church age. We are the bride of Christ. Those are called and filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus says the least of us is greater than John the Baptist. Do you get that? We have the presence of God in us. We don't have anything in ourselves, but God's infilling presence allows us to do and to be things that we could never do in our own strength. I reminded uh, Debbie and I were talking about this yesterday. In 2011, we took an outreach team to South Africa, and uh, we had uh, a young girl on the team that uh, came to us through Teen Challenge, and she'd had a history of drug abuse and real challenges in her life, but she had given her life to the Lord and she was doing really well. And she was on this team 
And on one particular day, we were asked to go and speak at a drug rehabilitation center. And we felt that she needs to share her story. She needs to teach that day and share her story. And she didn't want to. She said, I, I cannot speak. She was too nervous. She felt incompetent. She felt unable. She said, I, I know I'm going to mess it up. I know I cannot speak with any eloquence. And besides, there's a large crowd of people. How am I supposed to do this? And we kept pushing her and nudging her and pushing her. And she stood up to speak, and she began stammering. And the people, you know, when someone really struggles to speak, people kind of listen in a little bit more. And they began listening. By the time she finished speaking, she gave an altar call. Nineteen people gave their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ that day. She, in her own self, didn't have the eloquence or the strength to do it. But God used her, God worked through her to transform lives for eternity on that day. And it'll always remind me of that, that have you made yourself available to be used by God? We can always look at our weaknesses and our inadequacies and use that as an excuse. And God says, no, I've given you my presence in you. Therefore, when I called you, I have already equipped you to do what I've called you to do. Never look down on your calling. The second point is that Jesus chose us, not we him. He chose us. We didn't choose him. Matthew 4, 19, and he said to them, follow me. Jesus walked up to them and said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. As we saw the earlier, and I was talking, going through a little bit of the history, was the normal procedure of the day was that the rabbi would sit, and he would be teaching, and these Talmudim, or the potential Talmudim, would come to him and say, I would like to follow you. Jesus turned to them and said, I want you to follow me. Jesus chose them. It was upside down. The kingdom of heaven is always different to the kingdom of this earth. Jesus chose them. And then, in, in that normal procedure of the day, the, the, the Talmudim would first choose the rabbi, and then the rabbi then would say, yeah, if you're good enough. Well, Jesus knew they weren't good enough in their own strength, and yet he chose them. One of the reasons that I believe that is, is because it gave them confidence can you imagine the times when the disciples were struggling or when they were teaching and people were rejecting them? They have the confidence to know that my rabbi chose me. He chose me. So therefore, I must be worth something. I must be okay because he chose me. So when I'm not doing as well as I expected, I have the confidence to know that he chose me. Jesus chose them. Some of you are struggling right now. Maybe struggling in your marriage, you may be struggling in your career, you may be struggling in your workplace. Jesus chose you. And he chose you and he equipped you. Let that be your confidence. No matter what's going on around you, Jesus chose you. Not because of anything you brought to the table. And when he chooses you, he commits to you to equip you, to strengthen you, to uphold you. John 15, verse 16, we read what Jesus said, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask, in the, in the, ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. You know, throughout the, old, throughout the New Testament, we have Jesus and the apostles. We have the writings of Paul, which really focus a lot on being chosen. And the purpose of that is not so much that we've got to all become Calvinists. No. The purpose of that is to show the fact that we are not anything in our own, but God chose us, and that should bring us confidence. It should bring us great hope and confidence that the creator of the universe would choose us. And when times get hard, we can point to the fact that you chose me. You saw something in me, and you called me out. That's the confidence that we have. And then as a result of that, he chose us to bear fruit. Well, we cannot bear fruit in our own strength. He chose us to bear fruit because he gave us the Holy Spirit in order to bear fruit. 
When Jesus chose you and I, he made a commitment to us. He made a commitment to say, I'm choosing you. I'm going to use you as well. Allow yourself to be used by God. Paul writing to the church in Philippi, verse one, chapter 1, verse 6, And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. When Jesus called you, he has a plan for your life. He has a plan for your marriage. He has a plan for your career. And he will bring it to pass. Not only because he chose you, but because he is faithful and God cannot go against his character. And he is able. God is all-powerful. He will bring it to pass. Thirdly, our primary calling is to be with him. Our primary calling is to be with him. You know, when Jesus called his disciples, as I said earlier, he didn't say to them, okay, uh, this is where you're going to go, and this is what you're going to do, and I'm going to call you, and you're going to get to preach to people, and uh, gave them the whole plan of their lives. Jesus simply said, follow me, be with me. Jesus said, get to know me. He was inviting them into a relationship with himself. Out of that comes the fruit. Out of that comes the work. But the primary calling was relationship. Jesus was inviting them to come to know him. And when Jesus invites us, we come to know him. And one of the greatest ways to come to know Jesus is to know his word to us. How can we know our Savior when we do not know the word? This Bible that God has given us is called the word of God. It is the word of Jesus. From cover to cover, the Old Testament speaks about him. The New Testament speaks about him. It's all about Jesus pointing to him. And so when a follower of Jesus says, I don't have time to read the Bible, that person is saying, I don't want to know my rabbi. I don't want to know Jesus. I don't have time to get to know Jesus. But Jesus calls us. He calls his disciples and says, I want you to spend time with me. I want you to spend time in my word, getting to know me. You know, here at, at Grace Point, we have many opportunities for you to get to know the word. We have life groups. We have Sunday school classes. We have special studies. Obviously, we have Sunday morning where I endeavor in all my strength to preach the word of God. It's about getting to know Jesus that life-transforming relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. You know, if any of you spend time with Michael Cantu, I know he's, I think he's probably upstairs right now, but he's someone that if you cut him, he bleeds the Bible. Every time he's speaking, he is quoting scriptures because he has dwelt in God's word and he's made it part of his life. We all should be like that. When, when a situation arises, a scripture verse comes to mind. When a situation, a challenge comes to mind, it's, there's a promise in God's word. This is where it is. That's why we need to be in God's word. That's why we need to meditate and study on God's word, making it a part of our lives. We will never be able to produce fruit if the word of God is not part of our spirit, if it's not in us, if we're not dwelling on in, in God's word. If you're struggling in areas of your life and not seeing freedom, not seeing victory, spend time in God's Word, allowing the Holy Spirit to reveal truth to you and to speak to you. The fourth point is to follow Him, we have to leave it all. We have to leave everything behind. In verse 22, we read, And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed Him. So we have two pictures here. They left the boat and they left their father. Why does the, the uh, evangelist Matthew point out the boat and the father? Well, the boat represents a work. It re represents a way of sustaining themselves. It represents a career, a way of making money, a way that I can provide for myself. Jesus says, leave the boat behind. And then secondly, you have to leave the father, their father, their earthly father, and follow Jesus. Well, that's the most significant relationship. Whatever your most significant relationship is, sometimes you're called to leave that to follow Jesus. That's the challenge. So leaving the place 
or the career and leaving the most significant relationship in their lives. God was calling them out to follow Jesus. He has to take precedence over our work. He has to take precedence over our relationships. This gets really, I guess the rubber, this is where the rubber meets the road, as we say. Jesus takes precedent. If he is Lord over your life, he is Lord over all of your life your career, your way of providing for your family, and your relationships. Jesus is Lord. And some of you may never face the situation of having to actually leave your families or lose families. Many people in the persecuted church around the world, when they make a decision to follow Jesus Christ, they know they're going to be cut off from their families and possibly even face death as a result of it. Now, many of us will not face that, but you may feel God's calling into missions. You may feel God's calling into ministry in some way, and your family says no. Your parents may say, no, that's foolish. You need to do this. That's not common sense. And you have to be obedient to the call of Jesus on your life. Many of you know what I'm talking about. You've experienced that in your own lives where you've, you've felt the calling to go and you've said let me ask my family first. And they persuade you otherwise. Many of you have had to lose relationships, but Jesus Christ is Lord over your relationships. Some of you may have to give up jobs, may have to change your, your plans for your careers because of the call of Jesus on your life. Jesus says, follow me. You may have to give up a career. You may have to change uh, because God's calling you to go and plant a church somewhere. You may have to move somewhere. That's a tough decision, but it requires faith. The one who calls you is the one that's going to provide for you. Jesus is able to provide for you. You may be challenged to face a compromising ethical decision in your workplace, and you may say, well, if I don't go along with this, I could lose that bonus. If I don't go along with this, I could even lose my job. And Jesus said, I am sufficient. I will provide for you. I will take care of you. Every one of us, somewhere in our lives, will have these decisions to make, whether it's leaving the boat and following Jesus or leaving the family and following Jesus. When that decision comes, you need to know who it is you're following. Do you know Jesus, and is he sufficient to take care of you? My promise to you today is Jesus is sufficient. He will take care of you, and his promises over you are good, and they're for your benefit as well. Finally, he commands us to spiritually reproduce, to, to make other followers of Jesus. Jesus says in Matthew 4, 19, Follow me, and I will make you fishes of men. To be a disciple, remember, to be a Talmudim, a follower of the rabbi, is to become like him, to do what he does and to do what he did and shows in, as an example. That means that we have to do what Jesus did. Jesus shared the good news of the kingdom. Jesus came to share the good news. And so we, as Jesus' disciples, as his followers, are called to share the good news of the gospel message, to share the good news of what Jesus has done in our lives, to bear fruit. This is what Jesus said in John 15. This is bearing fruit. It's not just doing good things. It's reproducing ourselves spiritually, as Jesus has shown us. This is the key. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you won't be bearing fruit. But if you are a follower of Jesus, you must be bearing fruit. You must be reproducing yourself spiritually. It is a requirement of the rabbi. This is what he taught us to do. And if we're going to be followers of Jesus, we will be reproducing ourselves spiritually. There's not a question about it. We cannot read the Bible and see any other option but to be one who tells others about Jesus. And you may say, well, I, I'm shy and I, I don't easily talk to others about my faith and I kind of, you know, I'm reserved and it, it's difficult for me to kind of broach the subject. 
Well, yes, in our own strength, we cannot do it. But Jesus has given us his Holy Spirit in us, enabling us to do that and to be able to share. Notice when Jesus called his first disciples, he made a very interesting statement. We kind of gloss over this, but Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. We've read that many times. Have you noticed that Jesus didn't call them because of their skill? He didn't call them and say, um, Peter, you have something in your skill set that I need on my team, so I'm going to call you. John, you, you have a piece that I really need. Matthew, you've got a piece that I really need. Now, Jesus called them and says, I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to make you something that you were not. I'm going to use your abilities, yes, but I'm going to make you something that you are not, not because of your abilities, but because of my ability in you. Jesus calls us with the promise of making us something that we are not. Isn't that amazing? Jesus never calls us because of anything that we have in our own strength. He calls us because he knows what he can do through us by making us into something that we are not. My own personal story, I've always been um, an introvert, and uh, I, you know, I enjoy being in the forest by myself walking. And I just love being alone, and uh, I'm not an extrovert. And in fact, my early career as an engineer, it was wonderful. I could sit in front of a computer screen and occasionally go and have to talk to people, but for the most part, I was just me and the numbers, and I loved it. You know, I could just spend time working. And then the Lord called me out of that and said, I, I want you to be a missionary. And then the Lord slowly eased me and called me out of that and said, I want you to be a pastor. And I said, I, I, I cannot do that. I am an introvert. I don't speak well. I'm nervous. And God said, yes, I know of your inadequacies, but my strength in you. That's why I'm calling you. And so God has made me into something I was not. And every one of you, if you think about it, if you allow God to use you, He will make you into something you're not. And He will make us fishers of men. Even if we say, I don't know how to do that. I'm too shy. I don't have friends. God will make you into something that you're not. Because that's His promise when He called you. He promised to make you a fisher of men. He promised that over you. Jesus said to his disciples, I'm going to make you fishers of men. This is the essential part of being a disciple. A lot of people are still in that ancient Hebrew culture where they say, well, I want to be a disciple of the rabbi, so I just want to sit at his feet and just sit there and do nothing. I just want to sit because I'm in the presence of the, the rabbi. But the intention of the rabbi was to teach the young disciple, the young Talmud, to become like him, to do what he did, to know what he knew, to do things that he did. And that's the intention of us following Jesus. Jesus said, I'm calling you to reproduce yourself spiritually so that you can become like me. Isn't that the calling of God in our lives to become more like Jesus day by day, more like our Lord and Savior? There's no such thing as a non-reproducing Christian. It's, it's impossible. There's no such thing. So you have to think about your life and saying, am I bearing fruit? Am I truly bearing fruit? Am I truly being used of God? And many of us have to repent and say, I'm not doing what I'm called to do. I am not fulfilling the call of God on my life. Every one of us. Yes, your calling may be in different areas of ministry, but every one of us over above that are called to be fishers of men, to share the gospel with those around us. Jesus said in John 15 verse 8, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and listen to this, and so prove to be my disciples. It's a sign of being a follower of Jesus, is to bear fruit, to reproduce ourselves spiritually, to share the gospel with those around us. We know the Great Commission so well. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. But if we look at this verse, we know it so well, these two verses, and we can quote it, we've heard it preached many, many times, but there's one primary verb in this, and it's make disciples. That's the primary verb that the whole of the rest of the verse hangs on. It's to make disciples. So many of us, and, and I've been guilty of this, is focusing on the go. Well, if you go and you're not making disciples, you're just a tourist. How many times have you been on a mission trip and you've gone to places and you haven't shared the gospel? My friends, you've been a tourist. Everything hinges on making disciples, making followers of Jesus. Everything grows out of that. If we're not making disciples, we're not reproducing ourselves spiritually, we're not bearing fruit, we're not proving that we're disciples of Jesus Christ. It's all hanging on that. Jesus summarized his ministry in Luke 19. He says, the son came to seek and save the lost. If we're his disciples, we will do what our Lord and Savior does. We will make disciples. Robert Coleman, in the Master Plan of Evangelism, he said this, When will the church learn this lesson? Preaching to the masses, although necessary, will never suffice in the work of preparing leaders for evangelism. Nor can occasional prayer meetings and training classes for Christian workers to do this job. Individual women and men are God's method God's plan for disciple. It's not something, but it's someone. You and I are God's plan. You and I, God's method. He's chosen us to be his method for sharing the gospel. So as a church, we want to see this this year. We want to put God to the test and say, we're available to be used by you. But we want to be a church that multiplies ourselves, not just for the sake of numbers, but for the kingdom of God. Can you imagine as we would see miracles of lives transformed, of people coming to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, people being set free? I want to commit to this. This is who we are as followers of Jesus. And I believe that we're going to see remarkable miracles this year as we pursue this. Disciple making is not just teaching someone, it's showing someone. Allowing Jesus to use you by the power of the Holy Spirit to show someone how to follow Jesus Christ. So we have this campaign, and we're going to be looking over it for the next four weeks, this campaign of who's your one. And uh, at the back we have these uh, prayer guides, and we have this little really cool bookmark. And the prayer guides and the bookmarks kind of go together, but there's 30 days of readings and devotionals in here. And in fact, if you don't have a prayer journal, this is a really good one. It's a little devotional and a prayer journal. But every day you get to pray for the one. Now, what I mean by that is you need to go home and pray and say, Lord, who is the one person? I'm not asking you for 10, one person that you want me to share the gospel with. That one person that I can begin praying for. So I'm not asking you this afternoon to go and knock on their door and share the gospel with them. I'm saying, begin praying for them. That's what this prayer guide is for. And as you pray for them, you will get opportunities to share the gospel with them. There are people in your lives that God has placed there that only you can reach through the power of the Holy Spirit. So I challenge you, I invite you to do this. We're going to be looking at this again, as I say, over the the next few weeks. But it's not going to end there. I want this to become part of the culture of us as a church. And then when that one person comes to know the Lord, and by God's glory and grace, we, we see them baptized and become new people in Christ, we teach them to challenge who's your one. And then we take another one. I guess the, the, the real challenge as you're thinking about that, who's your one, is... Who's the one? Because you've probably got a number of names going through your head right now. People that don't quite have a relationship with Jesus Christ. People that you know that God has put in your life for a specific purpose. But start with one. 
and begin praying for one. Identify that one. Wouldn't you love to see that one come to know Jesus Christ? It may be a family member, it may be a co-worker, maybe your neighbor. But begin praying for that one. And let's see what God does this year. Dan and I always joke about uh, uh, starting things and, and testing them like a Petri dish, you know, like a little scientific experiment. Won't we take this as a church-wide Petri dish and say, I'm going to just try this. I'm going to trust God with this and see what He does. Let's take some risk and begin praying for that one that God has placed in your life. And let's see what God can do. Can you imagine what it would look like if that everybody who's here, and, I, and, and I'm so glad you're here even though it snowed, um, but if everybody who's here and everybody who's listening to the, to, the, uh, to the live stream chooses one, and we see those people come to know God. Because remember, it's not our own strength. It's not our own abilities. It is a power of God. It is the miracle of the Holy Spirit transforming their lives. We get to pray for them. Maybe as I've been speaking, you realize that you've been carrying the name of Jesus, but you're not really a disciple of Jesus. Maybe as I've been speaking, you've been saying, yeah, I, I've called myself a Christian all these years, but I'm not truly a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus. And that's the only kind that counts. The only kind of Christian that counts is a disciple of Jesus, knowing Jesus and becoming more like him. As we, we close, we're going to pray, and the worship team is going to come forward. But as we stand to sing our final song in a few moments, I'm going to ask you just to spend some time in prayer and begin asking the Lord to make you more of a disciple, more of a follower of Him, rather than simply uh, being a, uh, just a Christian in name only, but being a follower of Jesus. If that's you, just quietly commit that to the Lord. Our ministry team will be up front here, and I invite you to take advantage of the prayer team. If there's that one that God has already given to you, come bring it to the team and say, hey, would you pray with me about this person in my life? If anything that you need prayer for, they're available. Prayer for boldness. Pray for that opportunity to, to share the gospel. I invite you to do that. So would you stand with me as we close?